Thank you to the team for organizing this marathon and um, congratulations to all of you who are still standing. I don't know whether there's a prize for people who can actually answer questions about every single talk. There should be, I think, maybe a t-shirt or something. So um, in good form, um, I will not talk, I will talk neither about epigenetic mechanisms nor about human disease. And rather I'll take, I'll take you on our journey um, in looking for histones in all the wrong places, if you will, in our quest to look for the evolutionary origin of nucleosomes and of histones. Um, so um, I don't think I need to introduce the topic at large here. Uh, the entire eukaryotic genome is organized by nucleosomes and as such, um, it's really important. They're really important to regulate access to transcription, uh, machinery, replication, repair. They maintain the genomic stability and they're the targets of epigenetic control. And this holds true for um, universally all eukaryotes. Uh, so, um, we, we haven't really strayed very much from my original interest in nucleosomes, and we're still interested in uh, three major aspects of this um, really fascinating structural complex. Uh, first, like how are, how are nucleosomes decoded? What do the nucleus, nuclear machinery see when they uh, encounter DNA in a chromatin context? We have a quite large project on the structure, function, and enzymology of PARP1. Um, and other PARPs. We're interested in centromeric chromatin. We're also interested in what happens when um, an irresistible force, namely the RNA polymerase, encounters an immovable object, uh, and that would be the nucleosome. And so we're uh, investigating um, histone chaperones, for example, FACT, and ATP-dependent chromatin remodelers. And then finally, and this is going to be the main course of today's, uh, today's talk, is what is the evolutionary origin of the nucleosome. And this is kind of a, um, a very fundamental basic research kind of topic, whereas these other ones might be a little bit more disease oriented and a little more applied. So um, uh, before I jump into it, I just want to advertise there's postdoc positions available because people in my lab have done fabulously well. And, and as a result, they move on to bigger, better things. And so there's a number of really cool projects that are ripe for the picking. Um, and I just want to give you a brief vignette on some unpublished data that we're really excited about right now that, that pertains to centromeric chromatin, because I think it makes a really important point, and that is that nucleosomes are the interaction hubs for numerous nuclear factors. There's millions and millions of nucleosomes in the cell, and a factor can have a combination of choices. It can recognize the massively distorted DNA. It can recognize the histone surface or the tails. Uh, that would be our beloved readers and writers of post-translational modifications. And there can be any combinations of the two. But by far the most important interaction partner would be a nucleosome itself. And so in a way uh, we can almost liken uh, the, the fla different flavors of nucleosomes carrying different PTMs or carrying different histone variants. Uh, to the primary structure of amino acid sequence. And, and as such, that determines the secondary and tertiary structure of chromatin. And this, of course, is profoundly affected by epigenetic variations and also by interacting factors. And one really cool, uh, one really cool example for this is um, at, the, at the centromere. And um, Hang on, I think I messed up. I messed up one slide. I forgot one slide, so never mind. So at the, the centromere, as you know, is defined epigenetically defined by centromeric um, by the centromeric histone semp A. It's a replacement for the histone H3, and uh, there's a whole bunch of proteins that converge at the centromere um, to uh, to which then the spindle axis is attached to. Um, and one of the proteins that decodes centromeric histone H3 variant, SEMP-A, is the protein called SEMP-N. The nomenclature isn't the most imaginative, so you just have to bear with me. Um, and uh, what Cody Zhao in my lab has shown is that uh, SEMP-N promotes nucleosome-nucleosome interaction. So not only does it decode a centromeric SEMP-A containing nucleosome, it decodes, uh, it promotes uh, nucleosome-nucleosome interactions through an additional binding site um, at the opposite end. And so at this end here, it would decode SEMP-A. And at the other side, there's a helix that's very basically, very, very positively charged that lies in the groove of a neighboring nucleosome and thereby serves as a glue to, to, to kind of stack two nucleosomes together. 
Now, um, we've also shown, Cody's also shown that it can do this in high, in the context of higher order structure. And so he's shown that uh, on the cryo EM, you can form these beautiful regular arrays that are literally glued together by this purple protein, which, which is SEMP-N. And this can only be done with SEMP-A nucleosomes. Now, uh, in order to figure out whether this is really relevant to the cell and whether this um, it, it fulfills its role in the cell, we've teamed up with Aaron Strait's lab, in particular Magda Gebala, who's um, unearthed an ancient uh, essay um, published in 1963 and then more populated by some other people more recently. And that relies on the fact that heterochromatin is more resistant to shearing than euchromatin. So this is not very fancy. It's simply that more compact chromatin cannot be broken up as easily as more loosely organized chromatin. So you can cross-link chromatin, you can share it, and then you can separate, you can, you can um, fractionate uh, the samples on a sucrose density gradient. Um, and when you do that, and then you can run these on a gel and you can uh, uh, check where your proteins are using a Western blot. And so this, this would be typical data here where you have different the input material and then you look at different fractions um, from the from the gradient and you can um, you can western blot it for example for SEMP-A and what you find is that in a wild type cell line SEMP-A um, comes in very dense fractions so it seems to be very resistant to micrococcal nuclease digestion and this incidentally also co in co um, coincides with H3K9 trimethyl modification. So this is compact heterochromatin. When they do the same experiment in a cell line where SEMP-N has been degraded, degron, de uh, degran degradation of SEMP-N, um, we now see that SEMP-A is much more accessible. It moves to the more accessible region, uh, indicating that at the centromere we get uh, we get a loosening of chromatin high order structure because we are missing the glue that holds together SEMP-A nucleosomes. So, um, so with this, let me just um, let me just get to the main course, if you will, and that is what is the evolutionary origin of the nucleosome, uh, in particular histones and nucleosomes in non eukaryotic organisms. So, what you would normally do in a case like this is you would you would look at the evolutionary tree in eukaryotes and you would um, you would look at different branches and you would go at low um, quote unquote uh, not very highly evolved eukaryotes in this particular case maybe Giardia lambda and you would look at the nucleosome structures and then and you could potentially see how they evolved. Now in the case of histones because histones are the most conserved proteins uh, known to man uh, after actin I think in cytochrome C um, the nucleosome structures be, uh, are very, very conserved between in the different um, in the different branches of the eukaryotic evolutionary tree. So we can't really um, we can't really say how these things have evolved and how these things have come to be because they appear to be already perfect in this rather primitive quote unquote organism. So. Um, what do we do? Fortunately, there's a whole domain of life, and those those are the archaea or archaebacteria that um, um, live a very happy and and fulfilling life with just uh, one one or two single, very minimalistic histone proteins. And this was discovered in the early 1990s by John Reeve. And this, together with other findings, gave rise to this idea that uh, archaea were the origin, a worthy precursors, if you will, together with you bacteria of uh, the ancient eukaryote. They kind of teamed up, the bacteria formed the mitochondria, the archaea formed the nucleus, if you will, and brought with them the histones and the transcriptional machinery and all that good stuff. So um, we were a little less fancy than like thinking really deeply about evolution. We just simply wanted to know what can archaea tell us about the origins of the nucleosome. And um, Sean Larson in my lab, um, during COVID times, uh, he likes to code and he likes to do genome gazing. So he looked at uh, all known archaeal sequences and he found a lot of interesting groupings depending on where archaea live because they inhabit very, very different arenas of life. Some like it hot, some like it cold, some like it salty, some like it 
acidic, um, very different strategies of uh, what different um, of histone based chromatin organization in different archaea. Today, I just want to talk about thermophiles. These lovely ladies here, they live at 95 or 100 degrees Celsius. Those are our model organisms uh, because they can actually be grown um, in the lab. So let's talk about thermophiles. The histone the histones in thermophiles are very simple, uh, rather than our eukaryotic histones, which consist of, alpha, of, of, uh, of the canonical histone fold that, as you know, is kind of conserved structurally between all four histones. Um, we have additional tails and extensions that are very specific to H3, H4, H2, A, and H2B. For example, H3 always has the specific and helix. Uh, they have very specific and recognizable histone tails that you all like so much. Our kale histones are much shorter, and there's usually just two of them or one of them. And if there's two, they're very, very similar. So they form homodimers or very, very similar heterodimers, whereas eukaryotic histones, of course, form heterodimers where H3 always pairs up with H4 and H2A always pairs up with H2B. Over, over the, across the board, there's about 20 to 40% sequence similarity. So these are really quite dissimilar from eukaryotic histones and they're not sim more similar to H3 than they are to H2A, for example. Despite this, um, this uh, relatively low sequence homology, the structures of the histone fold dimers is very similar. This was discovered by John Reeves lab in collaboration um, um, by either NMR and X-ray crystallography later in 2000. This is a histone fold dimer of Archaea, and this is a histone fold dimer that I ripped out of the nucleosome. And so um, structurally, if you look at them, they look very, very similar, except for that, of course, eukaryotic histones have all this additional stuff hanging off of them, meaning the histone tails and the extension. And we don't have, and, and the Archaea don't have that. So the question is, how does a single tailless histone organize DNA? Why do these organisms need histones? And I just want to remind everybody, even though that's probably clear, that um, our genomes are vastly uh, larger than that of um, a thermophilic archaeon by orders of magnitude. And so compaction is probably not the main mission that these guys have. So why do they have histones and what do they do with them? So we determined a crystal structure of uh, histone dimers, three histone dimers bound to 90 base pairs of DNA. And um, by first approximation, they look very, very similar to eukaryotic histones. If you toggle between eukaryotes and, and archaeal histones, you see there the DNA is bent in very similar way. This is because the histone fold dimers that you can see here are very similar in structure and they bend and bind the DNA in very, very similar ways. And um, what really I, I still can't get over because I think it is just so, um, so amazing is that even at the very molecular detail, if you like dig down into the nerdiness of the protein DNA interaction interfaces, you see that the molecular details of the interactions are very, very similar. You see these main chain uh, phosphate interactions, you see side chains poking into the minor groove. So bacteria have already, archaeobacteria have already figured out how to bind and bend DNA in this beautiful 30 base pair arc uh, around them. And they have also figured out how to form tetramers through these four helix bundle structures that we know from histone H3. So histone H3 dimerizes with, it, with itself to join together two histone fold dimers through this four helix bundle structure here. And then we see a very similar interface between a, the uh, archaeal histones as well. The histidine is there. Uh, very similar types of interactions and very similar characteristics of this interface. And then when we kind of start to build up this structure, it becomes really interested, interesting because we are, we can form nucleosome-like structures that to all practical purposes look almost identical to the eukaryotic nucleosome in the overall pitch of the, of the helix and everything. But our kale chromatin, they can just keep going around and around and around, and that's exactly what they do. So this is um, this the, the, in a way they form like endless or continuous nucleosomes. Why do they do that? Um, the answer is quite simple. If you think about structure biology, 
eukaryotic histone dimers are heterodimers, meaning this end here is different from this end and has evolved to interact either with itself or with H2A, H2B. These guys here are homodimers. So this end looks exactly like this end. And so they just, this interface here looks like this interface here, looks like this interface here. And so they just keep going and they can stack histone units on top of each other in what at least in the crystal lattice looks like an endless, um, an endless helical ramp around which the DNA can wrap. Um, this is unlike the histone octomer, the eukaryotic histone octomer, which is where the bug stops. So there's only ever four histone fold dimers in the eukaryotic nucleosomes, whereas there can probably be a variable number um, that wraps the DNA in, um, in archaea. Uh, so I don't mean to give you the impression that we think this is like a stable, rigid rod. We think it's more like a slinky, and I'll I'll tell you a little more about why we think about why we think that. But for now, um, let's just ask whether these structures really exist outside the crystal lattice and in the cell. Um, and and so to do this, uh, the the first the first evidence that they actually really do exist in the cell comes from micrococcal nuclease patterns of archaeal chromatin ripped out from the cell without crosslinking. We're uh, actually after crosslinking, so we're 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 isolating chromatin after crosslinking. We're digesting it with micrococcal nuclease. We see this very profound and regular 30 base pair pattern, which is consistent with a micrococcal nucleus possibly cutting between every histone dimer. This is of course very different to the very characteristic 150 base pair pattern that we get from cutting between the different beads on a string on chromatin. Now, uh, we were curious what would happen if we disturb this interface by mutagenesis. So we kind of drive a wedge into the slinky and try to disturb it, um, what happens? It turns out uh, that our beautiful micrococcal nucleus pattern uh, is now destroyed. We only get uh, fragments that protect about 60 to 90 base pairs of DNA. So no more further wrapping, we interpret it as such. Uh, the organism lives, but it's really disturbed in its response to different food sources. And so we really do believe that these structures exist in archaea and they likely contribute to gene regulation. So this was kind of cool. Uh, now, what are the energetic contributions of slinky formation? and and just will say that uh, archaea have much less stuffing between their layers here. You see, this is kind of empty and see-through and the same orientation, the eukaryotic nucleosome, there's a lot of white stuff. Uh, and that white stuff comes from the histone extensions and all um, and, and additional regions that the archaea just don't have. Um, so in order to, to find out what the energetic contributions of stacking in Archaea would be, Sam Bowerman, that was also during COVID where we were all stuck at home, undertook it on himself to do some molecular dynamic simulation of different archaeosomes, he calls them, reconstituted in silico on different lengths of DNA. And so what he found was uh, that, um, uh, that when you just have three histone dimers and you don't really cross over, these nucleosomes are quite, or these particles are quite gymnastic and they kind of open up quite profoundly, uh, showing you this beautiful little uh, nucleosome dance, which just kind of makes me happy. Uh, when you then add an additional histone dimer to make like a histone octomer, um, you see that this is much more stabilized. So this would be this structure here compared to the structure that I've shown you before. So the, whereas the guys to the left open up much more, the guys to the right kind of keep it together in a much better way. They're still a little more mobile than eukaryotic nucleosome because they lack the stuffing. Um, a less fun way, uh, but a more scientific way to depict all of this is in this plot where we just show the separation of the DNA gyres um, during in the time course of the, uh, of the simulation, P of R, for, P of, P of R uh, function. And so these in black would be our open nucleus. And we see there's a significant portion that opens up quite significantly. The more uh, wraps we add, the more closed up these structures are, and then quite gratifyingly, if we introduce our mutation that drives a wedge between the slinky and silico, it seems to do the same thing in, um, in this context as well. Um, 
And so this is very, very consistent with our finding that uh, wild type archaeal chromatin is kind of cut open stochastically every 30 base pairs, forms this slinky. Whereas in this particular case here, we cannot do more than one wrap, if you will. And so we protect a lot less DNA. So these are a lot more disorganized. And therefore, the micrococcal nucleus has a much easier time to get at it. Uh, we then undertook cryo-AM um, structural determination of, of these archaeosomes reconstituted on 207 base pairs of DNA, and we got some really good class averages. This is the what we call a closed form. This on first approximation looks like a nucleosome, and then we found this really weird open form, uh, a minority of the particles, but um, very striking. And so we went ahead and solved the structure of both of this. This is work done by Sam Bowerman in the lab. Um, and he could fit the open form with uh, a nucleosome that has four dimers on one side. And then the remaining DNA is kind of splayed open in the right angle and is bound by three dimers. And that accounts for all seven dimers and the entire DNA sequence, just to make sure we don't have like nucleosomes kind of but on top of each other um, and, and pretend they're on one piece of DNA. This is a flare movie where we flare down the electron density levels. Um, and you can see even at the lowest, at the highest contour levels, um, the DNA is still connected quite nicely. And so we're quite confident that this is a single continuous DNA um, strand on which our seven histone dimers sit. So rather than forming a stacked slinky, it kind of opens up stochastically in this four plus three orientation. The second closed form can be fit with five histone dimers and 150 base pairs of DNA. So this really looks like it looks like the beginning of a slinky, but not really to the extent that we were hoping for. And so two dimers and 60 base pairs of DNA are missing here. So where are they? We then went back uh, and, and looked in our 2D class averages and really tried to squint very, very hard. And if you do that, you see that there's very faint density, kind of like a clothes hanger kind of thing, or a hook sticking off of each structure here, here, and it's also visible here uh, in, this, in this particular uh, class average as well. And so Sam managed to actually solve the structure, even though the, it, the, it is quite disordered. Um, and we can see the remaining bits of the DNA with associated histones. And so we now have a five plus two arrangement, again, accounting for the entire, all seven histone dimers and the entire length of the DNA. So um, this is how we think archaeal histones organize DNA in the cell. Not the entire chromosome is organized like this, but a significant portion of archaeal DNA is chromatinized, but it opens stochastically in various places, providing access to nuclear enzymes and also in this case to micrococcal nuclease. And so this is very, very consistent with this um, micro micrococcal digestion pattern that we observe. Now, why do we need all this extra stuff? That's a good question. First, um, it is uh, having expanded to four histones rather than just having one and having added all the histone tails and additional trimmings, we now have the opportunity to fine tune the protein DNA interaction phase, interface at each location. And indeed, what we find in eukaryotes is there's quite weak interactions here. There's quite weak interactions here. There's very strong interactions near the nucleosomal diet. And that's important for the function because nucleosomes have to open partially and do all kinds of gymnastics. Whereas in archaea, it's kind of loosey-goosey. They're all the same in between um, strength of protein DNA interactions. The second very important point, of course, is um, histone tails. Now we have the ability to decorate our histones with histone tails and to decorate those histone tails with a plethora of post-translational modifications um, that provide the basis for active motives business, I would say. Um, and so in, in Archaea, there's actually no known readers, writers, or erasers. And so there's no tails, there's no histone modifications. There doesn't seem to be a regulatory of these things. So uh, what we have here is uh, a situation with Archaea with simple no frills histones. They have already invented how to bind and bend DNA in this profound manner. Uh, in ways that are very, very similar to what we've kind of just appropriated, presumably. Um, polymerases in archaea are slowed down, but they're not inhibited. There's no evidence for PTMs. There's no remodeling factors, and they're self-assembling. 
And in eukaryotes, we've then expanded to four histones. We've added trimmings and decorations and, and regulatory um, potential. Um, the price we pay for this is these particles are much more stable now uh, and they profoundly inhibit DNA dependent processes. That is probably deliberate because now we can uh, have build in a reliance on PTMs, on remodeling factors, and those can be recruited and that adds additional um, regulatory potential to the system. And they also require histone chaperones for assembly. So now like, how do we get from here to here? Because even if our, in our lovely smiling Giardia, um, it has everything that we have. There's really nothing primitive about Giardia as far as chromatin goes. So what is the missing link? And I can't give you the answer, although I'm open to suggestions, but in our search for the missing link, we stumbled on these, on these really fascinating organisms, I will say, and they're called giant viruses. They're called nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses or NCLDVs. They are huge. I mean, look at those things. This is a bacterium. This is the largest one of them. Um, and and uh, this is a rhinovirus over here. So these things are massive. And even, um, um, even better, they don't, affect, uh, they don't affect us because that's the last thing we need right now is another virus to worry about. They mostly infect amoeba, which are waterborne little um, single cell organisms. Um, one subclass of these NCLDVs, the Merseviridae, um, have, uh, have large genomes as all of them do. And these guys encode histone-like proteins and they form these, uh, these highly dense uh, areas in their capsid that we don't really know what they are. So we decided to poke around a little there and take a look at their histones, unlike our histones, uh, which are separate genes for H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. These guys have fused histones. H4 is fused to H3, they're doublets, and H2B is fused to H2A. And so they're not proteolytically cleaved, they are indeed uh, histone doublets uh, in the virus. And uh, so we decided um, they're kind of weird enough for us to take a close look. So we, we made them and um, we, this allowed us to answer a lot of different questions or ask a lot of different questions. Can they bind DNA? If they do, what kind of structures do they form? Um, how are these connectors accommodated? Is that an easy thing? What do the connectors do? Um, how do they get to the viral factory? How do they get assembled in the absence of chaperones? And I think the most important question, like why on earth does this virus need its own histones? Um, because histones, uh, because viruses usually aren't shy in appropriating uh, proteins from their host. And so why not steal the host histones? What is different about these guys? So, um, so we do what we normally do in a case like this. Uh, we, we make them in bacteria, we assemble them onto various bits of DNA, viral DNA, as well as our favorite 601 DNA sequence and run them out on a gel and analyze them. And you can see here that they're actually, they look quite a bit larger here um, than, than uh, our control nucleosomes reconstitute on the same DNA. And that means they're probably a little bit more bloated, a little bit more unstable. Um, we then ran them out on an atomic force microscope and they mostly just croak. Mostly what you see is just free DNA. But if we use a trick that we use for cryo-EM, uh, we, see, uh, we see very nice particles. And when you do the height profile analysis, um, the height of this viral nucleosome looks now very similar to the height of our eukaryotic nucleosome. So they're pretty good particles. And then even better, uh, we put them on a grid and we, we, uh, we give them to Princess Krios and, and we got some beautiful uh, 2D class averages of viral nucleosomes reconstituted on two different lengths of DNA. This is of the same sequence. And Yang Lu and Ke Cody Zhao in my lab managed to solve the structure of both of these um, to quite good resolution. And what you can see here in first approximation, they really do look like eukaryotic nucleosomes. So they form nucleosome-like particles with some quite intriguing differences. For example, here, you will note that the ends of the DNA extend quite far out and they're very highly defined. Um, this is also kind of splayed open in a very defined way. So what's going on? Uh, we, we can uh, build uh, the uh, we can fit the electron density with DNA 
as well as with homology modeled histone models um, that we built from scratch. So, and, and then we had to build the connectors from scratch as well. By and large, these structures look quite a lot like um, eukaryotic nucleosome, nucleosomes, with the difference that the DNA ends are less organized and they're also a little bit more bloated, if you, if you will. So, um, um, so the distance between this gyre and this gyre is a little bit blown apart. It's almost like they've kind of um, blown up a little bit uh, due to steric considerations. All right, so um, this is an overlay of eukaryotic nucleosomes. We are just showing half of them here. With a viral nucleosome, you see by and large, all the secondary structural elements are where they're supposed to be. There's a couple of different, there's some subtle differences here. And then there's less DNA bound. And this is particularly noticeable when you look at this representation here on the longer piece of DNA, especially this guy here extends the DNA quite profoundly out into the, uh, solution and um, usually when that happens, uh, it should, it's normally very mobile, so we just can't see it. It just gets blurred out, and these are very, very highly defined, so we have no idea what's up with that. But we're interested in finding out. Now, um, Melbourne virus, the viral nucleosomes are also less positively charged than eukaryotic nucleosomes. This is particularly um, obvious when you look at the diet representation here. These are our nucleosomes. You see this very dark blue um, positively charged band on the histone that ser serves as a, as a landing pad for the DNA. And it's much less charged in Melbourne virus nucleosomes. Overall, the charges are, are significantly reduced, um, which explains their reduced stability, we think. And that's probably part of their biological role. But we can also see uh, the several hallmarks that people know and love are present. Like, for example, the acidic patch it's right here, a little bit different maybe in its configuration, but it's here. And many other features that we know from eukaryotic nucleosomes are there. And this is just what I indicated before. They're kind of blown apart a little bit. They look a little fatter if you compare this distance to this distance here. So how about those connectors? What Can those be accommodated? And it's super easy for the connector linking H to B with H to A, because the C terminus of H to B is here, and the N terminus of H to A is right over here. So we just kind of have to loop over, and boom, we're done. And there's um, several um, configurations of this loop that is compatible with the density. It's probably quite disordered. Um, so there's no problem there. It's a lot harder conceptually to picture how this works for histone H4 because histone H4 C terminus is kind of at the middle of the nucleosome. It pokes towards the middle. And um, it, uh, the end terminus of H3 is like smack on the other side. So how do we get from here to here? We kind of loop this thing over and then we weasel our way through the gyres of the DNA to loop over uh, to connect to the end terminal tail of H3. Uh, the density is quite well pronounced here. Um, there's high, quite highly conserved amino acids, uh, amino acids here, and many of them make um, contribute to talking to the DNA and to the underlying histones as well. But by and large, there's a little less. They need a little more space than if it weren't there, obviously, and so they kind of pry open the ends of the DNA, open it up a little bit, and that accounts for this veering sideways of the DNA that we observe in the structure. Um, all right, so finally, the H4 and terminal tail, everybody loves histone tails. The H4 and terminal, terminal tails in our, in our eukaryotic nucleosomes kind of latches over the DNA and then goes and interacts with other nucleosomes or um, readers or writers. Um, here, it goes the opposite way and it kind of latches over and, and interacts with the alpha-2 helix of itself. So this is quite interesting, and we don't really know what to make of that quite yet. So um, this is a movie. This is published, so I don't really have time to go through this. It just kind of summarizes all the salient features of the structure. But I, I, I really do want to get into the cell with you and, and um, discuss with you why the virus might possibly need these histones. Uh, so first, uh, we teamed up with Chantal Abergel, um in France. Um, who have uh, discovered these viruses. And uh, we first wanted to know what happens when you take a GFP-tagged uh, 
viral histone, does it know where to go? Where does it go? And so we do this with a control amoeba H2A. You, in, you put it into the cell, it knows exactly where to go. It belongs in the nucleus and that's where it goes. And then when we infect these cells with a virus afterwards, it stays in the nucleus. If we do the same experiment with viral H2A, H2B, uh, it has no idea what to do with itself. It hangs out in the cell, in the cytoplasm. It doesn't really go in the nucleus. But when we infect, it massively goes to the viral factory, which is a membrane-less uh, assembly where there's massive amounts of viral DNA replicated. Um, and uh, it kind of goes there immediately and doesn't go to the nucleus. And the same holds true for histone H4, H3. These two histones also co-localize in the viral factory. They do not go to the nucleus, presumably because they don't have a nuclear localization sequence. So they go in there. And so that was really good to know. And uh, we next uh, wondered how many of those viral histones are there and are they indeed overexpressed upon viral infection uh, as you would expect if they are important to the virus. So this is the uh, transcriptome data uh, that's been published by others and Chantal analyzed this in great detail for the proteins that interest us. So you can see here, this is two hours post infection. This is when the whole circus starts and you see massive overexpression of both types of histones and an additional one that I don't have time to talk about and DNA poly polymerase as well. We were actually hoping to see maybe some histone chaperones um, that might be overexpressed in the host, but it turns out that all host genes almost invariably are downregulated upon infection. That's a really typical thing that you see um, for viruses uh, because the virus wants to hog all the resources for itself. It really couldn't care less about the happiness of its host. All right. So, um, Mass spec analysis of the virus uh, of the of the infectious virus showed that histones are indeed very abundant. So we have about um, uh, we have hypothetical. So this is proteins ordered in uh, abundance. The most abundant proteins would be these hypothetical proteins here. We then have our H4, H3. We have a major capsid protein and H2A, H2B comes right after that. And when you do some fancy math, and these numbers are a little squishy and not as accurate as I would like them to be, but because that's really difficult to do. But what you can see, if you, if you do the calculations back of the envelope, there's enough histones, uh, enough viral histones to package the entire viral gen genome into nucleosomes. So finally, are histones needed for fitness and infectivity? So this is what happens normally. We have an amoeba with its uh, nucleosomal DNA, effect, infects, um, uh, the virus infects the amoeba. Um, the amoeba, uh, the, the host nucleus becomes kind of leaky, uh, polymerases leak out, uh, the vi viral DNA is replicated and transcribed by viral uh, proteins. Uh, the proteins are translated, the histones do not go into the nucleus, but rather return to the viral factory where they are assembled into, nucleos in, into nucleosomes, into the viral capsid. The virus is then infective and goes, it, the cell bursts open and that's its sad ending. Um, and the virus goes on and infects more amoeba. So then what you would normally do to figure out whether the viral histones are required for infectious particles, you would make a virus without those histone genes. Now, unfortunately, this is super hard and there was no system established. So Hugo Bisio in Chantal's lab had to, had to kind of rig the system so we can do these experiments. And indeed he managed to do this. He managed to knock out H4, H3 in the viral genome replace it with GFP so that we could see indeed that it was knocked out. You can actually make, uh, you can make viruses. Um, they contain DNA, but they contain no nucleosomes, no histones, and they do not infect the amoeba. So the amoeba uh, lives, is happy ever after. But if you complement with transiently transfected viral H3, H4, then the amoeba dies. And so this really showed to us that the histones are required for infectivity. So just to summarize, um, some answers, more questions, can they form nucleosomes? Yeah, they can. Uh, they're destabilized, they're more open, they have defined extended DNA. We don't really know about higher order structures, that's something we're very interested in. 
how are the connectors accommodated quite easily, their structural roles. How do they arrive at the viral factory? We don't really know, probably just attracted by the massive amounts of DNA. Who assembles them into nucleosomes? What are the histone chaperones that orchestrate their, their ordered assembly onto DNA? We don't know. Uh, we're really curious to find out. And does the virus need its own histones? Yeah, it does, but we actually really still don't know why that is. So with that, uh, I just wanna uh, finish and acknowledge people who've, who've done the work. The My Nucleosome Evo group um, uh, is, is shown here in, in blue. Cody Zhao did also was involved in both groups, but also did the SEMP-A work that I showed to you very briefly. Uh, both Cody here and Young here are now on the job market. And so if you see their applications, you should snag them up. You should also note our fabulous t-shirts for the whole lab. And I wanna acknowledge my collaborators, uh, the Strait and Verzinski lab for the Archeal, uh, for, for SEMP-A and um, for SEMP-A work and uh, the Sant'Angelo lab, um, Natalie Ahn at CU Boulder, John Reef, and in particular, Chantal Abershell. The work was uh, really spearheaded in Archaea by Francesca Mattiroli, who is now at the Hubrecht Institute and has her own lab. And with that, I'm happy to answer a question. If anybody is still alive and standing, I have postdoc positions available. These are some of our local mountains. You get to hang out with Princess Krios. You get to hug her. Um, and, and just to kind of show off, we really do get some fabulous um, images from, from Princess Krios and we get resolution of about 2.6 angstroms, which is killing me because I spent like eight years of my life, as you guys know, uh, to solve the structure by crystallography. And now it's almost like first year grad students who can pull this off. So with that, I'm happy to answer a question if we still have time. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Uh, wonderful talk, um, beautiful scenery, very nice t-shirts. <laughs> I, we, I am going to try and keep us on time. We've got a few questions coming through. I'll, I'll ask those ones very quickly. Um, the first is a question from Anurban uh, Dasgupta. Very interesting presentation. The cryo-AM structure depicting the open state of the slinky seems fascinating. What do you think is the physiological significance of the slinky existing in two different conformations? Uh, does either of the RKL chromatin and the mm. um, MVNLP have any H1 linker involvement? Um, searching for concerns, histone chaperones for the NVNLP would be super rewarding. Yeah, well, thank you for that. So uh, the, the two slinky structures that I showed are actually not different. They just kind of, we think, open in different places. So you either open in the five plus two or in the four plus three configuration. Uh, now we're trying to figure out whether we can get them to open in the six plus three or 10 plus two, whatever. So we're trying to get more states of this by using longer DNA. So that's to answer your first question. I think we just have a slinky that just opens stochastically and we just managed to capture two of those states, maybe because of the DNA sequence that we used or because of the length of the DNA that we used. So we're, we're changing that. The second question was here, uh, oh, it disappeared. Uh, the second question was about the viral, I think. Um, what was this? So let me see if I can find I it. I can pull it out again, maybe. Uh, maybe I can't. I will. The sec so the second bit was, what do you think is the physiological significance of the slinky existing in two different confirmations? Yeah, we did that. Does I archaeal does chromatin? Of the, mm. Yeah, does either of the archaeal chromatin and MVNLP have any H1 link involvement? So archaeal chromatin, as far as we know, does not, but there are other chromatin protein that in archaea that are quite abundant. We don't know how they contribute yet to chromatin higher order structure in archaea. In the particular virus that we looked at, that one does not have any linker histone, but there's another giant virus that seems to have picked up a linker histone, which is kind of weird. And so we're looking at that. So far, we haven't really gotten it to do much, but it looks like a linker histone. So that's definitely interesting. Um, I have another, which is from Niccolo Areco. Uh, have you tested if the recombinant or kale nucleosomes can still assemble into a slinky chromatin after heating them to the high temperature of the RK, mm -hmm. uh, the RK uh, bacteria live in? 
Yeah, so we haven't really kind of balled them up because, uh, but uh, they're very, very resilient. You can just dump them onto DNA and then you can really mistreat them and leave them for months and they still are bound to the DNA. So we haven't really done any thermal studies because um, as I pointed out in the cell, there's a, a lot of additional proteins and also weird ionic uh, conditions that protect them against the heat. So we haven't really, the short answer is we haven't really looked at this whole heat requirement. I should say though, that there's a bunch of um, mesophile and even like um, archaea that live at room temperature and they have very, very similar histones. So it doesn't really seem to be an adaptation to hot temperatures, but we don't know whether they, they form their slinkies. We think they do. Okay, and yeah, there are some more questions, which I think in the interest of time, we're going to just follow up later. I um, can type the answers, yeah. And then maybe we'll just pass it on.